So the next speaker is Professor Charlie Kim from uh, Georgia Institute of Technology. So his lab focuses on mobile robots for intelligent physical assistance in context of healthcare. Is it okay? It's not going now. Yeah, that's so today, he's going to give a talk on tactics and things for assistive robots. Fire hose talk, which is appropriate here at MIT. Uh, I'm going to talk about haptic sensing for assistive robots. And I want to preface my talk by just emphasizing that what is good depends on the goals. If you look across biology, there are a wide variety of sensors, different characteristics, different types of sensors, different placements, and it really depends on the goals of that creature. Uh, anything from electric sensing for an electric eel to this phenomenal uh, sensory organ of the star nosed mole. Uh, in my lab, the healthcare robotics lab, the goals that we're interested in are for robots to provide physical assistance. And so I'm going to be talking about haptic sensing in that context. I'm going to give you a quick overview of assistive robotics from my lab's perspective. Uh, then talk about work we've done in data-driven models and forces, whole arm tactile sensing, and thermal tactile sensing. So millions of people require assistance on a daily basis. I uh, estimate 12, 12 million people in the U.S. require assistance with one or more daily tasks. And this could be for a number of reasons. This could be due to disease, injury, or just the effects of aging. And, and we've worked with hundreds of participants in various studies, and we've found that overall people are very open to receiving assistance from mobile manipulators. It's a promising technology uh, with which people could get assistance, including older adults uh, and people with severe motor impairments. And in general, if you look at the tasks uh, that it would be good for robots to help people with, uh, a way of dividing them up is commonly used in medical literature are by both the activities of daily living, which are self-care tasks, and classically feeding, toileting, dressing, and transfers. And these are predictive of the ability of, in, of a person to live independently. And then instrumental activities of daily living, IADLs, typically housework and food preparation, taking medications. And importantly, with respect to this workshop, both of these involve manipulation. ADLs tend to involve manipulation around a person's body, whereas instrumental activities of daily living involve manipulation in human environments where there are humans and objects and clutter. So a, a lot of the work you'll see uh, in, in the rest of my talk comes from a collaboration that my lab has had with Henry Evans and Jane Evans. It started out as a collaboration that also involved Willow Garage, Robots for Humanity uh, Project. So Matei was involved with this. Uh, Henry unfortunately had a brainstem stroke at the age of 40 and lost the ability to move his body, but he is able to move his head and uh, his thumb, and through that, through an off-the-shelf head tracker and a regular mouse, you can control a computer through a mouse. And at the, in this project, one of the things we did was enable, develop a system that enabled Henry to shave in his home, and also develop systems that would enable Henry to automate aspects of his home. He could go around and say, oh, use this task for this tag, this behavior for this tag, for example, to open that drawer, well, I'm not sure if you've got Henry in that, but, or to open the refrigerator. And, uh, okay. <laughs> That's a lot of fun. So, so this is just a sense of the types of things we want these robots to be able to do in homes in order to provide assistance. So the natural question is how can haptic sensing help? And I'm first going to start with work we've done with data-driven models of forces for robot-assisted tasks, and specifically for activities of daily living. Those are those close-to-the-body types of tasks. And one aspect of that, one thing that became very clear, is when we first tested the shaving system with Henry, he got some nicks and abrasions. We were really surprised by it. When we looked into it, we found he was, allowed, he was applying 25 newtons to himself, whereas his, as his wife would only apply 3 newtons to him while shaving. And so that seemed like that was probably part of the problem. And we did a small study with able-bodied participants in my lab with the motion force capture system. We found 10 newtons should be enough for anybody to shave. And I think this illustrates something that's problematic with robotics. If I had handed that electric shaver to you and had as you help Henry, I doubt any of you would have allowed him to apply so much force to his face. You have this common sense that you've had over a lifetime experience shaving yourself that you can then apply when you're assisting someone else in the task. Uh, after 
we implemented just backing off when it reached that threshold, then uh, Henry didn't have a problem since. Uh, another example of that is that uh, people don't shave their eyes. Right? That's not something people do. That's common sense for us. It seems comical, and yet if you don't tell the robots, they don't know. And so this sort of procedure where you're doing motion and force capture may be one way, is one way that you can give robots some of this common sense. More recently, we've been working on dressing, robot-assisted dressing. A lot of the work in the robotics community has focused on vision as a sensory modality. Uh, but that's a challenge because often dressing is associated with occluding one's body. That's part of the goal, typically. And it's also interesting because it can be actually a bit risky. So whereas like a cloth like this is very bendable, it's quite flexible, when you put it in tension, it gets caught very quickly and you can practically strangle someone. So the forces can go up quickly. And I've spoken with some people with disabilities who have had assistance. I remember one person in particular, and he, he was worried when his friend was trying to help him because he started applying large forces to his neck. Uh, fortunately, it, it, it wasn't a robot, and the person uh, responded and helped. Um, anyway, so we're really pushing to see the extent to which robots can use ascent forces and haptic sensing in this domain to infer what's going on in the task of dressing. And we started with a study with 12 people using a specialized robot, and we collected the forces at the end of that for these three types of outcomes. The, the hospital gown actually missing the person's arm, the arm did not go in the sleeve, the arm gets caught on the opening to the sleeve, or it's actually a good outcome, the arm goes well into the sleeve. We found hidden markup models and time series of forces. Uh, our system could do a good job of recognizing these three outcomes and also predicting which of those outcomes is going to happen early in the process. Uh, we then, and this is in collaboration with Professor Greg Turk and Professor Karen Liu in their labs, uh, we looked at physics-based simulations of this process and generating synthetic haptic data. And then we've been able to train hidden market models based on that synthetic haptic data. And they've performed comparably well to hidden markup models trained on with 12 people's data. Which, you know, if you can do that, that's a great savings because there's a risk to people you involve in, in situations like this. And there's a lot of time and effort. So I think it was, uh, you could take one person, data from one person, then optimize the simulation to match those kinds of forces. And then after that, generate training data that would result in HMMs that perform pretty well relative to HMMs trained up with a lot more people. Well, now, uh, one of the more recent things we've done with this physics based simulation is now trying to give robots more common sense about what's going on in this task. You have a lifetime experience dressing yourself, you have a sense of what those forces are like. And I think of this as trying to give robots that common sense. So when, the, when a robot is trying to assist them with, with dressing, giving that robot the ability to infer what the person is feeling during the task. And our representation for that is a, a force distribution across the person's arm. And we use a physics-based simulation to generate lots of data. We use a standard recurrent neural network, LSTMs, to then enable the robot, just based on the forces, torques, and velocity at its end detector, to infer what the clock is doing to the person's arm. And it, it works works pretty well. So this is what's happening in ground treatment simulation, and this is what the robot is inferring, or at least what the, the learning system is inferring is happening. Okay. <coughs> and with other types of tasks like. Situations such as getting caught, which is an important one to, you know, to, to detect that early. So once again, all the robot is doing is it's just using the force of the force of velocity sense at its end effector to infer what's happening to, to that body. Of course, the question is the extent to which this works with real people. And we're still working on this, but uh, this is sort of where things are now. It works, it actually does work pretty well. Uh, so this is what the robot thinks is happening to the person's arm, what that person is experiencing in terms of forces applied to his arm, and the robot is only using sensing at its end vector. Uh, we've also been looking at using combining force sensing with other types of modalities, including sound. Uh, so, like I said, we want robots to have common sense. So when things like this happen, no, no. 
No! <laughs> we want them to know, right? I mean, that, that is obvious to us. Something is not right. And we want the robot to at least be able to operate conservatively and stop. And as you might expect, when detecting anomalies in those sort of situations, having multiple modalities helps. Having force-based modalities, including tactile sensing, skin, joint ports, and force torque sensor, help. But also kinematic sensing help for kinematics of the spoon, for example, sound in terms of microphone at near the spoon. And, and that's a, a lot of that's because different types of anomalies tend to fall in different sensory modalities, right? So, so if the user shouts, well, that's something where clearly microphone is a good way to detect that. Uh, if there's an issue with uh, a trajectory going off, that's a place where kinematics can play a good role. And if it's, but on the other hand, if it's something where it's happening while the spoon is in the person's mouth, well then forces and torques can be quite useful. Uh, one challenge that I think I, I'd love to see the community look at more is that you know, for a very, for a high amplitude anomaly, it's easy to detect it very rapidly without much latency, and to do so with a high true positive rate, very few false positives, but then with more subtle anomalies, you get uh, multiple things going wrong. When you have something that's a very subtle anomaly, it takes longer to detect it, or you also are going to have a lower true positive rate. All these are set to a constant false positive rate. So it, it's, it's a real challenge, and it's something that could make a, an important difference. Uh, through this system, Henry is also able to uh, eat yogurt as he had wished in his home uh, not that long ago. Uh, so he's using the system, and the anomaly detector did work. Uh, it caught a lot of artificial anomalies because anomalies are never there when you want them. And then it also, uh, I think it actually caught a couple of real anomalies that happened over the sessions. Okay, so that's activities of daily living and collecting everyday forces in order to do useful things. And now we'll talk a little bit about instrumental activities of daily living and using these uh, everyday forces and models of everyday forces to do useful things. And I, in this case, doors. Doors are pervasive in human environments. A lot of the world is behind doors in terms of interesting objects and such. And robots have a choice. The aggressive timid are smart. And here's an example of that. A spring-loaded door takes about 60 newtons to open, whereas a kitchen cabinet will be about 5 newtons. If the robot is aggressive, well, it will be able to open all these things. But if it gets to a kitchen cabinet and it's stuck, it will apply inappropriate forces, risk damaging itself, risk damaging the environment, risk hurting someone. Similarly, if it's timid, well, it will be able to open the kitchen cabinet, but now it's not actually doing all the things it could do. It's not able to open the refrigerator. It's not able to open the spring loaded door. So we really want robots to be smart. And we'd like robots to have the common sense to know, to have some sense of what force is appropriate for various types of doors when opening, when opening them. And we can actually do more than that because uh, we developed a, a simple portable force motion capture system. Members of the lab, including Kai, uh, went out and collected force and kinematic data from doors all over Atlanta. And one thing we found is that if you use a quadrostatic model, where you take the tangentially applied force as a function of the door opening angle, it's very consistent. And it's notice, what's, one thing that's really notable here is these are the forces for this door that were applied while opening it by two different people and two different robots. So it gives, if you're using, another nice thing about this, I think, is that if you're actually willing to use, to go through the trouble of using physical units, there is a better opportunity for robots and people to share what they've learned and to capture data in a mutually beneficial way. Also, once you have this kind of representation, this may, by the way, correspond with some of your common sense. If you're opening a your refrigerator, you first have to pull really hard, and then it becomes very easy. You see that there? And similarly with the spring load door, you have to keep actually exerting a fairly strong force at various angles. Uh, once you have these types of profiles, you can categorize the mechanism based on that force profile over time, or over angle, and also recognize individual instances of doors. And as I was talking about earlier, you do a better job detecting if there's some sort of collision or if something's wrong. So the more the robot knows about that particular device, the better it can, the job it can do of <coughs> applying as little force as possible to open it while also detecting if something has gone wrong. Uh, more recently, we've looked at combining force and sound when closing mechanisms using that same sort of anomaly detection approach. And, and for a number of those mechanisms, there's a very recognizable sound, and if something goes wrong, that that's, can be uh, useful to the robot to detect if something's wrong. There, everything's going well. In this case, we're using bid markup models, multimodal bid markup models. And we have uh, a time-varying likelihood threshold, and if the likelihood 
drop it below it, then detects an anomaly set. So the sound didn't wasn't right for one thing there. Okay, so that's the section on data-driven models of forces for robot assisted tasks. So a big part of this is giving robots common sense about forces during tasks. And if they have that, they can detect anomalies and unsafe situations, recognize ob object instances and classes, infer task relevant state. Uh, forces are useful for sharing. I made a quick note of that. And that there is a data collection challenge, right? How do we get this data? Well, and I showed a number of approaches, you know, which others have used, physics-based simulations, handheld devices, robots with human participants. They all have benefits and drawbacks, right? Some are more difficult, some have higher fidelity. Uh, and so you have to sort of pick and choose. Okay, now I'm going to talk a bit about our work on whole arm tactile sensing. So a dominant strategy in robotics has been to avoid contact between the robot's arm and the world, its own body, and people. And yet if you look at people, we make contact with our arms in the world quite frequently. We make contact with our own bodies quite frequently. And when we're providing assistance to people, it's, it's also a common occurrence that our arm makes contact with the environment or the person that we're assisting. Uh, and there, if we choose to not allow robots to make contact in this manner, there really is a penalty. Uh, so in this case, we did just a geometric simulation. We said, OK, what, where, what poses is the robot no longer able to reach if we impose a four centimeter safety mark? And you'll see this red cloud indicates places where there's an end effector pose that the robot can no longer reach because it has this four, meter sa uh, four centimeter safety mark. And that actually scale, does not scale well. With five centimeters, 20% of the poses are lost. 10 centimeters, half the poses are lost. So there really is a cost in terms of the effectiveness of the, ro of the robot if you choose to uh, enforce a safety margin. So uh, we developed controllers that were designed for contact. The assumption for these controllers are that low contact forces have no associated penalty, that the robot has low stiffness and compliant joints, and also that the robot has whole arm tactile sensing. Now, low stiffness compliant joints are pretty common now, but tactile sensing, especially whole body tactile sensing, is still relatively rare. If we look in biology, it is ubiquitous. Even from single cell level, millimeter, centimeter, meter, it's just built into those systems, and I think that's a really valuable thing that I hope robots will, over time, be able to emulate. Because once you have that, and we're using model predictive control, there are these physics based models of, that predict what's going to happen. Robots can regulate the, in this case, it's regulating those forces as it pushes through to reach that goal. Uh, in this case, Mark Kilpack's still here. In this case, it's using uh, a model of its dynamics as well to, reg to reduce the possibility of collision forces. One thing to emphasize here is the robot has no model of that environment ahead of time. It's just reaching in through the sense of touch. Uh, we conducted about 65,000 simulations of a planar robot reaching in clutter. And one thing that was uh, nice to find was that, especially as you get into higher clutter, that the whole arm tactile sensing for that simulated robot, it performed better with the whole arm tactile sensing than curling force torque sensing. And that's both in terms of reach, successfully reaching goals in the simulations, as well as keeping the forces lower in the simulations when contact happened. So there, there is an, an advantage, at least in those simulations, that suggests there's a real advantage to having ta whole arm tactile sensing opposed to something like curling force torque sensing. Uh, we also looked at contact with the joints. That's a challenging problem. It's a challenging problem for sensor developments because you have this geometry that's changing over time. Uh, our approach was to develop stretchable tactile sensors, which we covered that articulated joint. Uh, it's a good idea because it is, in fact, at least in our simulations, as you might suspect, you're just as likely to have contact at the joint as other places on the arm, so it's not a safe zone. Uh, and also, the robot can now, once it has that, it is able to reach in these environments. Of course, it can also try to interpret the signal it's receiving. In this case, uh, top row. Uh, in this case, the robot says, OK, this is foliage. There are two types of categories of objects. There are trunks and there are leaves. And then it uses hidden market models to categorize contact. And if it's leaves, it just ignores it. But if it's a trunk, it actually places it in its volumetric map because it cares about that. It's not going to be able to push through that. And with that sparse map, it's still helpful because then it can replan to, to go and get it the next time it can go around that. Uh, we also want to test this in assisted context. So we developed the sensors for the PR2. This was iterative development. And I really wanted to show this because uh, Rob Helm mentioned I think it was quite insightful. The importance of sensing at the edges. 
Now this was through an empirical method, and the main cost function was that every time that it was redone, students had to go to the sewing machine and make a new sensor. So if people did not add, if students did not add sensors uh, <laughs> that weren't useful, and you'll see that although we were willing to have very large areas, those sensors at the edges were important. They were really important to the functionality. Uh, Henry Evans was able to use this. He was able to do tasks he hadn't done before at his, when he was in bed. Uh, and he was very happy with it. He felt safer. It really is a qualitative difference in terms of his in, impressions of working with the robot. Of course, we also want to see if that was just him or if other people would be OK with such large contact. Uh, so we did a small study with able-bodied participants in which they had to grasp an object and then place it at a location that would involve large contact between the robot's arm and the, the participant's body. And found that people were remarkably open to that contact. It, wasn't, it not, didn't appear to be much of an issue. In summary, for pole arm tactile sensing, uh, very useful for reaching <coughs> butter, reaching locations in butter, such as reaching around the human body. There's a big challenge here because it's an immature technology. Uh, really, there aren't great technologies yet, I think, for large area tactile sensing. Uh, the bigger picture, permitting context value, what makes more poses reachable, it reduces line of sight sensing requirements, and it creates opportunities to sense through touch, such as that incidental contact, detecting leads, detecting the trunk. Finally, last section, thermal tactile sensing. So when you touch something in the environment, uh, assuming your finger has had time to heat up and the object is at the ambient temperature, when you touch it, heat transfers from your finger to that object. And that heat over time, as the heat is transferring, it has different rates that depend on the type of material. And we have this common sense that, oh, if we touch metal, it feels cooler. Heat's transferring partly because the heat's transferring much more quickly than such as wood, which feel, doesn't feel so cold. And this uh, is largely explained by the thermal inducivity of materials. If a uh, material has high thermal inducivity, such as aluminum, then that heat transfers very rapidly. If it has low thermal, uh, thermal inducivity, such as cardboard, then the heat doesn't transfer very quickly. So that's useful for material recognition. But it also turns out we found that combining that with passive thermal sensing at the same time, both heated sensors and unheated sensors, has value, especially when detecting contact with people. Uh, to show this, one of the things we've done is we had a handheld device with both passive and active thermal sensing on it, and people took it into a home environment, in particular bathrooms, because a lot of assistive tasks take place in bathrooms. They touch lots of different objects, and we also, they touch people's shoulders, which are clothed, as well as bare skin on the wrist. And this is what some of the data looks like. So in this case, as you might expect, toothbrushes, the heat doesn't transfer as quickly from the active heated sensor as it does from the counter. Counters tend to feel colder than, for example, a toothbrush is often made of plastic. Uh, in terms of detecting contact with people versus these objects in a bathroom, which would be a useful distinction to make in an assistive context, uh, the passive thermal sensing worked especially well, which makes sense because the other objects are at the ambient temperature, the person is above the ambient temperature. And then together, passive and active thermal sensing work best when distinguishing between other types of objects. Now in this case, I want to emphasize that you know, I, I see tactile sensing as a different problem from vision, at least for robots. If in many contexts, if a robot can distinguish between two materials well, that could be useful. It doesn't need to be out of hundreds of materials. And here, our notion is there's a tactile foreground and a tactile background for many tasks. So if my goal is to grab my phone on this table, the phone is a tactile foreground, the table is a tactile background. If I put my hand out like this, it's actually it's remarkably evident, more so than I anticipated at first, which, what parts of my hand are touching the tactile background and what parts of my hand are touching the tactile foreground. Any guess as to why it became so evident? The phone is hot. <laughs> the phone is actually pretty warm, and the, this table is pretty cold, and it's really obvious to me which parts of my hand are touching which. And it, once you ha the robot has that, then it can orient its hand and move its hand with respect to that target, that tactile foreground. So we really <coughs> concentrate our evaluation on these sort of uh, assist things that would be tactile foreground, tactile background discrimination tasks that would be relevant to assistive robotics, such as a towel on a towel rack, toothbrush on, on a countertop, uh, things like that. And it did, it did, it did well with a uh, sufficient length of time in terms of contact. We also developed a fabric-based tactile sensor which has heated both active and passive thermal sensing on it. Uh, we've evaluated it with the robot performing some tasks. 
such as sliding these materials. Uh, and in these cases, it, with sufficient time, a few seconds, it did, it did pretty well. Where it performs least well is when two materials, as you might expect, have thermal effusivities that are close. If the thermal effusivities of the two materials, then that, that temperature over time, those curves look very similar. It's difficult to distinguish between them. We also had it touch people, both clothed parts of the body as well as unclothed parts of the body, the wrist. Uh, and it uh, did well, but once again, it does best if it has more time. Uh, so a quarter second is still possibly useful, but it's not, not as accurate. So thermal tactile sensing. Uh, one advantage of it is less sensitive to the contact mechanics than force sensing, as long as it remains in contact. It can recognize contact with materials with distinct inclusivities, with the human body, with relevant objects. I think two of the main challenges of it are it takes time to heat up the sensor, and it takes time for the heat to transfer. And uh, so there's a really a temporal limitation when you're dealing with thermal sensing. So in summary, uh, these are examples of haptic sensing, the capabilities they give, and the assistive tasks uh, for which they have relevance. I know I'm, I'm pretty much out, I'm getting close to being out of time. How much time do I have? Uh, one minute. One minute? Yep. Aren't you in my lab? <laughs> <laughs> uh, very grateful for the many organizations that helped support this research and for the many people who've been involved with it. Uh, the best thanks you could give is to go to our website, read the papers, and cite our papers. We love that. Uh, and for the last couple of minutes, I just want to say, coming soon from Topo, a lot of uh, cool work coming uh, in terms of using more real-world data, leveraging physics-based models, and rapid inference of object properties. He has successfully defended. It's an exciting time in our lab, although we're sad for him to leave. <laughs> sure. Extent there's more time, and this is related to Topo's work, and this also relates to Rob Howe's presentation. Uh, Physics-based models can be hugely valuable, uh, and one way they can be useful is to generate synthetic data. I've talked about that. But another thing which, which I thought was great, because Rob Howe also touched on this, and uh, Topo's work will touch on this as soon as it's published, is to identify limits of perception. You know, if you really have, with the physics-based model, you can find out things where it doesn't matter how much data you have, there, you, it's not, systems are not going to be able to make a distinction. Uh, likewise, the performance data models. And maybe even most importantly, to avoid dooming yourself to succeed, or dooming yourself to success. Uh, so, and by that I mean, and my example would be, for example, with temperature sensing. If you don't have at least some reasonable physics-based model in your brain when you go into a problem with temperature sensing, you are at great risk and peril of doing very bad research. So. I'll tell you a situation. I give you this data. It's a passive thermal sensor. It's touched various objects. And now you're going to put it through all that data through a machine learning system, and it's going to recognize which object was being touched. It works. It's magic. It's so wonderful. And maybe then you find out that, oh, actually, the room temperature varied. It was one temperature while you were touching one object, another temperature when you were touching another object. And if you're not thinking about it, and you don't have some notion, at least some notion of the physics in your brain, you can really fool yourself. And you have, you have to be careful. So uh, just uh, I think there's great value in, in us embracing physics-based models, recognizing the limitations, but, but making use of them. And with that, that's it. You know, I mean, well, for one thing, we, we <laughs> we're, we're not hitting. I think we have not gone through that many, and I'd say the key reason is because our robots move slowly and compliantly. Uh, and that's just comes with the territory. And actually, I think some, I worry sometimes about students from my lab because they think that's the way robots are, and then they could encounter some other robot and get into trouble. Uh, but actually, I'll tell you the one thing where we got in real trouble with the force torque sensor. We, we moved to a new lab, we had these beautiful sunny windows. We were doing this dressing work. The data all of a sudden looked strange. I, I, Jan, you've had this? Yes. Photoelectric effect. We didn't even know it was exposed, but light was going in there and introducing additional force signals. So beware, because that one really took a long time for us to get to the bottom of. But yes, we have gone through more than I'd like. <laughs> That's for sure. If you don't have a trick or a bottle of sensor that's really robust. I wish it were just ATI. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. So, so what were your predicting forces on the patient while dressing them? And, and I mean, 
data learning simulation. Mm -hmm. Does that generalize to different patient arm poses, to different garments, to different dressing trajectories? We, we've tested generalization in simulation for trajectories and for um, speeds. But we haven't uh, done, and oh, and also arm poses. So, but it was trained on a lot of different arm poses. And, you know, it's, it's definitely something that you have to really worry about. Um, I think it's uh, good enough to be useful based on our preliminary test. I mean, which I think is really, in the end, the big question is, is this going to be useful? Can it be useful in the real world? And, you know, I've had it go on my arm. I've seen what it's inferring. And qualitatively, it seems actually pretty good, pretty accurate. So, uh, but hopefully we're going to shore that up and, and provide some more accurate information later. The fact that it does anything useful with the real world when it's only been trained in simulation is a good sign to some extent. Um, yeah. So, <coughs> Charlie, you mentioned like it's difficult to detect subtle anomalies, right? <laughs> right, you could say that almost sounds tautological. I think it is, right? <laughs> like, because, I mean, it's the right. framing of the problem, right? So, so, so in, in that particular graph that I showed you, it was with a step function with different magnitudes. Okay. So that was that was one where, you know, we were able to just characterize. But I, I it's certainly more, the, what constitutes something subtle, you're right, is going to vary. It's going to really depend. So that was in a constrained situation to illustrate the, this phenomenon. But also, like, what, like, do you have a good definition of what an anomaly is? Oh, oh, well, that, yeah, that, that, backs up to things. Uh, the, in our case, it's an operational situation where the robot has a lot of data where things have been successful, and now it wants to determine when something deviates from success. So that could be it's going to be a failed case, but that could be that it's just something that's very different from the successful cases with which it has experience, and it's just a matter of uncertainty. Because we don't, we want the robots, especially when they're working and helping people who uh, have less ability to do things and protect themselves to be able to operate conservatively. Okay. Uh, is there any kind of like forgetting function of what's normal as time goes on if things are drifting? Uh, you mean in terms of uh, the anomaly detection? Yeah. That, it's an interesting question. I think, um, and, and there's a tough, I mean, we're, we're trying to be careful in using ROC curves and, and using like area under the curve because ultimately it's, it really is a trade off of, you know, true positive versus false positive kind of situations. Um, that said, with the sensitivities we were using, for example, when we tested with Henry, uh, I was really worried because all the training data came from able-bodied participants. And usually that's something that doesn't work out so well, especially when Henry has uh, impairments in his mouth. Uh, and yet it seemed to still have, uh, have some success in that kind of situation. I, so uh, we're, we're not explicitly kind of doing something to deal with drift. It really is just data driven. Uh, and I, I think something that's interesting along those lines in the long term is the extent to which robots can really get data from that individual and get to know that individual's habits and thereby become more sensitive to things that are going wrong. So let's deck our speaker again.